Grace and peace to you and welcome to worship for Sunday, January the 22nd, 2023 from Charleswood United Church in Winnipeg. My name is Michael Wilson. I'm aided as ever by Benjamin and together it is our great joy to offer you this time of prayer, praise and reflection. I remind us that Charleswood United Church is on Treaty 1 land, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree and Dene people and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We are a community committed to a future of right relations and reconciliation. From this Wednesday past until next Wednesday is what is commonly referred to as the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. It is an initiative of the World Council of Churches and the Canadian Council of Churches, of which our denomination is a member, to lift up the relationship we have with churches um, beyond our own, to be grateful for the neighboring churches that surround us, to be conscious of the divisions and differences we have had in the past, and to place at the forefront God's invitation to work together. I'm standing in front of the baptism banner here in the sanctuary of Charleswood, because baptism is the ultimate symbol of our Christian unity. At the end of our baptism services, we all say the uh, refrain together, all who are united in the covenant of baptism are the body of Christ in the world. This year's Week of Prayer for Christian Unity has adopted the theme from Isaiah 1 verse 17, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Churches no longer need to work towards some organic union or institutional unity. We need to work together for the things that God is doing in the world, doing good and seeking justice. We are grateful for all who join in this effort. Indeed, we are grateful for all who, through their baptism, represent the body of Christ in the world. We're delighted you have joined us for worship this week. We hope it is a source of hope and inspiration to you. Let us worship God together. Testament prophet Isaiah in chapter 1 beginning at verse 10. Let us listen for the word of God. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams 
and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who asked this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation, I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove your evil deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us argue it out, says the Lord. If your sins are like scarlet, will they become like snow? If they are red like crimson, will they become like wool? Amen. Thanks be to God. Like at work and prayer, to Jesus I repair. May Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ be praised. He is the one so pure and holy. He is the true Almighty God, deliverer, provider, defender, the everlasting Holy God, the everlasting. Comes the day when from the heart we say, May Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ be praised. The powers of darkness fear, the darkness when fear. This we shall be May Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ be praised. He is the one so pure and was working in his office in the Vatican and he received a phone call. It was God. God said, Holy Father, I have some good news and some bad news. Oh, said the Pope, 
tell me the good news. God said, I have decided that all the churches of the world should be one. There has been too much division and too much harm brought on by that division. And so the time has come for churches of the world to be united as one body. Wow, said the Pope, that is good news. May I ask, what is the bad news? God said, I'm phoning from Salt Lake City. <laughs> this is the week of prayer for Christian unity. It is an initiative of the World Council of Churches, an invitation more than anything else, to spend some time being deliberate, being intentional, reminding ourselves that for all the differences that exist among and between Christian churches, and there are many, many churches, and we have many, many differences, that when it comes to the things that matter most, there ought to be unity among us. And we should be grateful, thankful, for our neighboring churches, wherever we are and wherever they may be found. Every year, resources for the Week of Prayer of Christian Unity are produced by an ecumenical team, and this year they have shared the theme for the year and chosen as their theme Isaiah 1, verse 17. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. It is part of a larger block of material in Isaiah, and it is common material to prophetic writings. The nature of prophetic writings is that the voice of the prophet assumes the voice of God and speaks directly to God's people. And for the most part, in prophetic writings in the Old Testament, when that happens, the people are called to account there is some denouncing of the way religion has been exercised and an announcing of the way religion ought to be received and practiced. And if there is a template for that, it is that the prophets criticize when God's people have put too much emphasis on ritual and sacrifice, which was a common way of worshiping in in ancient Judaism. There's too much emphasis on that and not on the common good and our need to care for one another. So it is you hear in the passage that we read from Isaiah chapter 1, that prophet assuming the voice of God and, and, and saying, why do I need uh, uh, the, the sacrifice of rams or, 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 or I've had enough of your, of your well-fed beasts and then calls people's attention to, in these simple phrases, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice. I say it's common, it's, it's kind of, prophetic writings are complicated when we, when we read them, but it's simple enough and it's a common enough motif throughout all of scripture. It is, repeated in a, in a varying form in the familiar words of Micah, right? And in Micah chapter 6, we read that rhetorical question, what does the Lord require of us? And, and, and to establish that question, Micah asks, will God be pleased with, with thousands of rams or 10,000 rivers of oil? You know, lifting up that complicated way we can make religious life and then answering in a simple phrase no this is what God requires of you seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God it was a simple answer that John the Baptist gave to the people who came out to him as he offered this baptism of repentance what are we to do they say in the gospel of Luke John simply tells them if you've got two shirts Give one to the person who has none. Be generous, and goes on to explain, to be honest and to be nonviolent. These are the things that lead to repentance, are the mark 
of repentance, and they are actions, not beliefs. And of course, all of this prophetic witness is embodied in Jesus in, in many, many different ways, most obviously in the, in the temple itself, uh, the place where those sacrifices of, of ancient Judaism took place as Jesus goes into the temple and turns over the, the tables of the money changers who were creating layer after layer uh, of, of obstacles for, the, for common people to come into the temple and to worship God, turns over the table of the money changers and says, you have turned my father's house into a den of thieves. It's not the only place that Jesus bears prophetic witness of this, of this nature. Part of the week of prayer for Christian unity um, suggested worship uh, resources was to read the gospel lesson that we read today from Matthew 25, sometimes referred to as the story of the last judgment. I have said and written elsewhere that one way of understanding or interpreting the gospel of Matthew is to look at the beginning and the end, very near the beginning, I mean after the birth story and baptism and call of disciples, when Jesus begins to teach, he preaches the Sermon on the Mount. It begins in Matthew 5, verse 1. And at the outset of the Sermon on the Mount are what we have come to call the Beatitudes, that list of blessings. I have said that the Beatitudes might be thought of as a table of contents. These blessings are announced, and then for the next 20 chapters or so, those blessings are realized in the lives of people who encounter Jesus. And that Matthew has 28 chapters, and 20, chapters 26, 27, and 28 are the Easter story, the arrest, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus. And that chapter 25 offers the summation or the closing of the teaching of Jesus. And so when we encounter the last judgment, this parable of the last ju judgment told by Jesus, what we seem to be reading is everything that you've encountered, everything that he's talked about, all those blessings he's enacted, how would you summarize them? And he does so as Micah did, as Isaiah did, in a prophetic witness stated so simply, easy to remember, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you came to me. When did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you drink, naked and clothe you, a stranger and welcome you, sick or in prison and visit you? When you did it to one of the least of these, you did it also to me. The things we have in common is our capacity to do good and to use the church as a means to help others learn to do good and cease to do evil. But unity among Christian churches is a difficult thing, and I'm not sure that organic unity is the intention or maybe even the desire of the week of prayer for Christian unity. It's certainly not the mission statement of the World Council of Churches or the Canadian Council of Churches. But there have been times in which we can learn how amazing things are accomplished by churches living together. It, it, it has taken place in our own Canadian church history. In the 1970s, there was a moment and churches came together in a uh, organization called Plura. Plura sounds like the opposite of singular, but it was actually an acronym, and it stood for, the P was for Presbyterian, and the L was for Lutheran, the U was for United, the R was for Roman Catholic, and the A was for Anglican. Plura churches worked together, and they created 12 coalitions so that our collective overseas mission work could be done together and therefore be more effective and more targeted. Twelve coalitions that 
that, that worked in the areas of, 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 of human rights and of, of, of development, of emergency relief, um, and, and, and 12 because they would target a certain area. One, one would work particularly on Africa and particularly on, particularly on Latin America. Development education was done through a, through a single plura coalition called 10 Days for World Development. Some of you may, may, may remember that one. They even joined ecumenically, again, working in unity with our brothers and sisters in Mennonite traditions to form Project Plowshares to do peace advocacy. Over the course of time, 20 years or so, as churches shrunk and membership aged and in particular resources became more scarce, it was more difficult to fund all of this work, um, the plural coalitions, one by one, dissolved. But the intention of all the things that they did still lives within the makeup of all the constituent churches, I would suggest. And that today it is less possible for churches to ba ba bind together and exercise some sort of organizational power uh, than it once was. After all, the organization of Plura is now 50 years, 50 years ago. But nevertheless, it is incumbent upon churches to, to, to receive that biblical imperative that finds expression in Isaiah 1, verse 17, and is repeated over and over and over again and is made explicitly clear in the ministry of Jesus, that churches can remain places where people learn to do good. Or if I can reshape that a little bit and quote author Brian McLaren, the great potential for the churches today is to be schools of love. Schools of love in the deepest sense, uh, uh, love in a social sense, love in a justice sense, love the way we e experienced it and witnessed it in the civil rights movement under the leadership of Martin Luther King Jr., whose, um, whose birthday was observed with a holiday in the United States this past week. A love that is self-giving, self sacrificing, a love that teaches about community, a love that helps us understand we are part of something greater than ourselves, a love that finds its deepest expression in unity, unity of purpose, unity in action, unity for love and for justice where churches will not be schools of such love, I fear they will wither and die. But where they continue to live out that high biblical calling, where they remain committed to this greatest of gifts that is love, the love with which, without which nothing can really be accomplished or claimed, where churches in unity exercise that ministry, no matter how small they may be, they will be reborn. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us unite our hearts and minds together in prayer. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, making all things new, we thank you for your abundant grace poured out on all creation, as there is no place and no one where your love does not extend. We praise you for our common joy. We thank you that this is a gift and that your light shines on us all. We thank you for the joy-filled laughter of children, which sounds the same in every language. We thank you for the wisdom of elders, which never depends on the color of skin. We thank you for the beauty of the seasons, no matter where they are experienced. We thank you for the saving shelter of faith in church, temple, synagogue, and mosque. We thank you for our sister churches and the congregations of this neighborhood and our collective witness to what is good and just. We thank you for the wonder of your revelation in ancient and indigenous spiritualities. We pray for our unity with sisters and brothers most vulnerable in the deepest cold. We pray for our unity with sisters and brothers who are ill or ailing, that healing may be a gift for all. We pray for our unity with the frightened of our community, offering a place of sanctuary from the violence that endangers them. God of grace, in Jesus you have offered a gift for the Spirit in us all. Let us accept this gift in humble service and play the small role that unites your people in a common purpose for the common good. Accept the prayers we offer as together we pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Seek the ways of wisdom, she who does where earth was new. Follow closely what she teaches, for her words are right and true. Wisdom clears the path to justice, showing us what love must do. Listen to the voice of wisdom, crying in the marketplace. Hear the word made flesh among us, full of glory, truth, and grace. When the word takes root and ripens, peace and righteousness and grace. Sister wisdom, come assist us, nurture all who seek rebirth. Spirit, God, and close companion, bring to light our sacred birth. Free us to become your people, holy friends of God. Thank you for joining us in worship. I hope and I pray that it has been a source of blessing and inspiration for you. I'm just going to mention what I said last week, that I have published a, a book. It is called A Pastoral Pandemic, Remaining Connected During a Time of Disconnection. It is an edited version of the letters that I sent out during the two years that worship was suspended. 
If you have any interest in it, get in touch with me by phone or email at the church. For now, be well, be safe, and be hopeful. Amen.